From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening and thank you for joining us. In a proposed move that could have reverber reverber reverberating effects nationwide and even here in the 49th state, officials with the National Transportation Safety Board have made recommendations calling for stricter drunk driving laws. That's right. On Tuesday in a news release, the NTSB recommended that blood alcohol content legal limit be lowered to 0.05% around the nation. It's all part of what the agency is calling a bold set of targeted interventions to put the country on a course to eliminate alcohol impaired driving crashes. The 19 recommenda recommendations call for stronger laws, swifter enforcement and expanded use of technology. Currently in Alaska, the legal limit for a driver's BAC is 0.08%. All 50 states hold drivers to the same legal limit. Reached for comment today in Fairbanks, Colonel Keith Mallard, director with the Alaska State Trooper says, as with all recommendations, they'll take a wait and see approach. Um, uh, the federal government comes out with recommendations all the time, um, like we do with uh, uh, any recommendations. We, we, as a state, will consider them, we'll evaluate them independently within the state, and then we'll determine what direction we want to go. Last year in Alaska, 11 people were killed in alcohol-related crashes compared to 34 people a decade ago. That's according to data compiled from the Alaska Highway Safety Office. The Alaska Department of Public Safety Commissioner Joe Masters said that reduction can be contributed to increased enforcement on roadways, media campaigns, and road engineering. Alaska State Troopers are on the lookout for a 69-year-old North Pole man who they say sexually abused two young girls last summer and then left the state and country for Peru. Moises Rodriguez Gonzalez is charged with a single count of first-degree sexual abuse of a minor and two counts of second-degree child sexual abuse. Authorities say they received a report of abuse in early July 2012 from the State Office of Children's Services. They say the two alleged victims, ages 9 and 15, told them that Gonzalez had touched them inappropriately on several occasions last summer. Troopers say Gonzalez left the country for Peru when the investigation came to light and has not returned. Ceremonies honoring Alaska's 67 fallen officers took place earlier today in downtown Fairbanks. Today's activities were just one of many statewide commemorating Alaska Police Memorial Day, which was celebrated on May 10th. The farthest north chapter of the Alaska Peace Officers Association sponsored the local ceremony at the Fairbanks Police Department. Statewide events coincide with National Police Memorial Day, which is also being recognized on May 15th every year. 2013 has been an especially tough year for law enforcement communities as they've lost three members of that community already. A village safety officer, Alaska State Trooper, as well as a veteran helicopter pilot. Alaska holds its main memorial service the Friday before the National Memorial so families of the fallen officers can attend both events. It's uh, quite a spectacular feeling to see uh, the, the public support and, and the officers here to support those who've fallen and it's uh, you know, it's a lot of tragedy you know, behind this day, but it, uh, it's a day for us to, to remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, and uh, it's a privilege, it's an honor. It means being here for your brothers and sisters in uniform and standing by everybody that's here today as well as those that are no longer with us and, and really showing that support um, for everybody. The new center will have more on police memorial activities this weekend on the Saturday edition of the Fairbanks Evening News and New Center Final. Although this year's spring temperatures have been at record lows, Denali National Park is preparing to open its doors. Some parts of the park open today. These include the entrance facilities and Denali Visitor Center, which open to the public. Shuttles to bring visitors to the park are expected to begin next week and will provide access to the park as far as Toklat River. Buses will begin running the full length of the road the first week of June if the weather cooperates. The spring's temps have had an unusual effect on the park and its abilities to open all of its facilities on time. We are having some challenges getting running water to those facilities. These are our entrance area facilities, such as the Denali Visitor Center, Marino Grill. The, uh, they're just having trouble keeping the, getting the lines thawed and, and charging the water into the various facilities. We anticipate that we may have problems opening up some campgrounds that are scheduled to open next week, such as the Savage River, Teclanica River campgrounds. We have actually directed our, con our reservation service to not take any new reservations. All right, when we come back, a Fairbanks man is reported missing in Florida. Also, our weekly military report, those starts after the break. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to the Fairbanks Evening News. A 40-year-old Fairbanks man is the subject of area-wide searches on ocean waters between Fort Myers and Key West, Florida. Now that's according to the Miami Herald. The news agency reports that the U.S. Coast Guard received a distress radio beacon from, from Jay Rydberg's boat, the 39-foot trimaran, about 30 miles north of Key West. Coast Guard officials say Rydberg left Fort Myers on Monday and never arrived in Key West as he was scheduled to do so on Tuesday. The 7th Coast Guard District launched a cutter and air crew from Miami to search for Rydberg. Now this is a developing story and New Central 11 will have more as information becomes available. A report released today from the University of the Arctic's Institute for Applied Circumpolar Policy recommends a slew of rules and policies be implemented quickly amongst Arctic nations. The IACP is a partnership between the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Dartmouth College, Dartmouth College rather, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The report claims because of accelerated sea ice melt and the pace of global warming, the new Arctic's abundant energy and natural resources are exposed to development. It suggests Arctic nations move quickly to adopt shipping rules, improve oil spill safeguards, and create safety standards in polar water. The report recommends the Arctic Council, made up of several Arctic countries, expand on the recommendations when they meet this week in Sweden. In an interview with New Center 11 last week, Fairbanks North Star Borough Mayor Luke Hopkins expressed his approval for new funding that aims to keep recycling services at the University of Alaska Fairbanks up and running. The $125,000 in funding approved last week by the Borough Assembly will allow the Borough to support recycling bins at the Taku parking lot recycling site on Farmers Loop Road. Early last week, UAF Chancellor Brian Rogers had announced their intent to shut down the site because of rising costs. Hopkins said Friday during the Interior Democrats' luncheon that he was, quote, glad to get the funding back in the budget, end quote. He said the Assembly saw there was a viable need and in his opinion, they did the right thing. It was just in the nick of time, so to speak, because I had hoped that the Assembly uh, would approve um, funding for recycle contracts, and because uh, that was just the, the last few hours, so to speak, as the Assembly went to approve the budget. Uh, if it didn't happen then, then there would have to be a separate ordinance coming forward, and wouldn't be able to meet that timeline that the uh, uh, Chancellor Rogers had put in the letter. So. It, all this moved forward in the nick of time, and I'm very pleased that it did. It's time for military medical personnel to experience Alaska through Operation Arctic Care. New Center 11's Monty Bowen has details in this week's military report. Operation Arctic Care is a multi-service humanitarian training program taking place above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. It focuses on teaching U.S. forces from different services how to work together in peacetime support operations, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief. We are currently in the process of conducting Arctic Care 13, uh, which is a medical and dental support uh, exercise in the Northwest Arctic Borough of Northern Alaska. We are currently in 12 villages of the entire surrounding area, spread out in an area across the size, uh, almost the size of Indiana. A major part of the training comes thanks to Black Hawk helicopters from the Alaska Air National Guard. I mean, we've actually had a debt of six Black Hawks that have been attached to us through the entire mission who have run daily, daily support missions and have truly been the absolutely essential logistics piece that we need to make this happen. The primary focus is on quick in and out missions. Uh, where we can see as many patients and provide as many, uh, provide as many services that are one-time services uh, in order to help the population. Those taking part in Arctic Care are made ready to respond and work in any cold weather location in the world. If I ever found myself uh, walking outside and saying 18 degrees was warm, I, if you would have told me that I would have ever made that statement, uh, I would have called you crazy. But when you're dealing with negative 10 degree temperatures out here, 18 degrees actually is very warm. Operation Arctic Care, even though it is training, brings medical, dental, and veterinary aid to 12 rural villages of Alaska. Monty Bowen, New Center 11. The Military Report is brought to you by Stanley Nissan. Innovation for all. You know, I wish they could zip over here and find out what's wrong with my mouth tonight. I can't pronounce <laughs> a thing. Uh, but that All was right, a All right, well, but Joe can. Yeah, Joe can. He's, and he's yeah. got a lot in sports coming yeah, up next. Yeah, he's got last night's sports action, uh, I think, softball and soccer highlights, soccer. if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, that's it. Great. Also, he's got uh, what could decide the future of the Yukon Quest. Find out about that story and more with Joe in sports.
Hello, Interior Sports fans. Joe Cook back in the sports seat for you this evening. Now, how about some sports? We start this evening with high school softball. It was a cold night in the middle of May, which I hear is rare for Alaska, but it didn't stop these tough girls. The Wolfpack and Patriots had a doubleheader with West Valley taking the first game 18-2, but North Pole made it a game in the second outing, down 7-3 in the second inning. The Patriots make a run. Jamie Teets, she will get a K for North Pole. Then the Patriots will get a hit and pull within two, 7-5. West Valley gets a new pitcher and Shiana McLean, who finished up the inning, got the Wolfpack out of a jam. West Valley puts it away with this hit by Erica Marlin, brings in two for the Wolfpack. West Valley gets the sweep with a 10-7 win in game two. The South Davis Fields are just one-stop shop for softball right next door to that West Valley Patriots game with the Hutchinson Hawks and Monroe Rams. The Hawks already won game one by a score of 21-3, picking up the action in game two. Hutchinson has a 9-2 lead, and it will grow a bit off the bat of the Hawks as a double brings in Kiana Edwards for the run. Jamie Hammond pitched the entire game. The Hawks win 11-3 in game two, both three inning games, and Hutchinson will get the sweep. And continuing with high school spring sports slate from last night, we go up to Richardson for boys soccer. The North Pole Patriots were on the pitch with the Hutchinson Hawks. The Patriots were aiming to get four MAC wins in a row, and a goal here by Rafael Martinez would help. That was one of his three goals for a hat trick. And take a look at this goal, the header by Brett Grill, making it 4-0 North Pole. Tony Crane would get on the scoring as well with his two goals. Josh Million, the million-dollar man, he would go down in the first half, and he was helped off the the field by his coach. He did not return in the first half. The Patriots, however, had a big lead. Garrett Wollman, he would score and the Patriots roll 8-0. Their next game is a big one. The short season finale against the only other unbeaten team in the MAC, the West Valley Wolfpack. Now, speaking of the Wolfpack, they took care of business as well in yesterday's afternoon game, matching the Patriots scoring output with an 8-0 win over the Monroe Rams. West Valley was led in scoring by Donald Carr and Christian Keeter, who both had two goals. The Wolfpack are 4-0 in the MAC. May see and have a 4-2 and two overall record. West Valley will play North Pole Thursday night for the number one seed in this weekend's MAC tournament. In girls soccer, the Hutchinson Hawks secured the number one seed in the girls MAC bracket yesterday with another big win, a 3-0 shutout of North Pole. Ellie Vizi, Ashley Stark, and Kaylee Baker provide the offense for Hutch and Angel Ochoa notched the shutout for Hutchinson. The Hawks will have some time off with the bye and won't play again until 5.30 this Saturday against the winner of Friday's number four and number five seat matchup. And to round up the prep sports in the interior last night, the North Pole Patriots and Delta Junction Huskies got together on the diamond. The Patriots were all over the Huskies in a 24-3 romp in just three innings. With all that offense, someone had to get off. Tyson Harrell almost had a cycle last night for North Pole. Harrell smacked a home run, triple, two singles, and got six RBIs. He just needed that double. Pitchers Tyler Wilbur, Jason Stecker, and Brandon Becker combined for a one-hitter in the win. North Pole is now 4-0 in the MAC and are 4-4 overall. And lastly tonight, a note for tomorrow. The Yukon Quest will have the Alaska Annual General Membership Meeting tomorrow, Thursday the 16th, the Alpine Lodge at 6 p.m. This meeting is open to the public. You can meet the board and suggest race ideas. Also, members will vote for a new board of directors. Judy Courier, Nicole Hendricks, Stephanie Knable, Bill McDonald, and Sue Sprinkle are the nominees. Four out of the five will be voted in. The 2014 Yukon Quest starts right here in Fairbanks on the first day of February next year. We caught off with Marty Story, executive director of the Yukon Quest, about the importance of this meeting. Basically, we have nine board members, a mushers representative, and then eight board members that each have alternating two-year terms. So we'll pick up four new board members tomorrow, and the ballots are all out. If anybody would like to become a member and come join us at the Alpine Lodge tomorrow night, Thursday, at 6 p.m., you can sign up to be an individual member for $40 and then you have a right to vote and you can help pick the new board members that are going to take the Yukon Quest into 2014. And that'll do it for sports tonight. Thanks for rocking with me for a little while. For more KTVF Sports, we're on Twitter, YouTube. You can also get our mobile app and, of course, WebCenter11.com. Stay cool, Alaska. Mike Schultz has your full weather forecast coming up next. We'll catch you next time. Hey, welcome back into Fairbanks TV News, everyone. Mike Schultz with you once again for a look at weather. And I wish I had better news, but it looks like we're going to go through a major change that's going to bring us some cold temperatures back in, maybe even some snow Saturday. But after that, 
things get a little better. I know you've heard it before, but we'll talk more about that a little bit. Our photograph tonight, sent in by Mary Andrews from Delta Junction. She was able to capture some swans flying overhead. A nice photograph. You have a photograph to share. By all means, send it to Mike Schultz at ktbf11.com. Here's our numbers this time of year. Normally, a high 61 to the low is 38. The record high, 81 in 1915. Record low, 23 in 1937. Our high today was 48 degrees. And the sunshine works out to about 18 hours and 44 minutes minutes of daylight, the gain of seven minutes from yesterday. Okay, here's what's going on. The satellite picture is showing a lot of moisture down over the uh, Gulf of Alaska, but the thing we're keeping our eye on is this frontal boundary coming in from the northwest. It's bringing a lot of cold air from uh, uh, Siberia, and that's going to be moving across the interior through the next couple days, bringing the colder regime of air, but after that it moves through fairly fast, so we keep our eyes on that and keep our fingers crossed. What's going on across the rest of the state? Cloudy skies over southeast Alaska, at least around Ketchikan. Rain showers at Kodiak, Cold Bay looking at cloudy skies. Some snow flurry activity around Nome and partly cloudy to cloudy skies at Barrow and Fort Yukon with 46 at Fort Yukon. Lower 48 weather, again hot temperatures, not as hot as yesterday, 78, uh, 79 in Minneapolis was 98 there yesterday. 101 degrees in Phoenix and showers and thunderstorms across Texas for good reason. Here's an area of low pressure rolling across parts of Oklahoma into Kansas, Missouri, and Arkansas, bringing a lot of thunderstorm activity. This weekend, the jet stream will be far enough north that it will allow a lot of hot air to move over a large portion of the country, but still very cool and showery over the Pacific Northwest. Back to Alaska for tomorrow, cloudy skies at barrel snow showers in Nome, partly cloudy for Fort Yukon. Here in the interior, we're looking at uh, increasing clouds for Fairbanks and Healy over the uh, southeast part of the state. Again, rain showers scattered from Juneau to Ketchikan and over the southwest part of the state. Looking at snow at Bethel, partly cloudy skies in Cold Bay and rainy at Kodiak and around the Anchorage Bull, it looks like a mix of rain and snow in Anchorage and Valdez with rain for Homer. Okay, once again, time for our kids' weather. And all this week, we're talking with the kids from uh, Joy Elementary School. Here's three kids uh, with an interesting question for me. Hi, my name's Anna. I'm Stanley. And I'm Cora. Here is a weather, here's a weather question for, a web, for the weatherman. How cold does the temperature have to be to turn rain into snow? You might think you might need freezing temperatures to have snow, but you can actually get snow at about 36 to 37 degrees. It'll big white fluffy flakes, that's good news. And tomorrow night the teacher will be here with a unique weather fact to cap off the week. Uh, pollen count for tonight showing a little bit of a rise now all the way across the boards, the trees, weeds, and the grass in addition to the mold. So we'll keep an eye on that. The Tana Valley Clinic updating us each night. And also a flood advisory now in effect until 1030 tomorrow night. A flood advisory effect for residents along the Tana River in the Salsha area. Some ice jams forming and causing blockage. So we've got to keep an eye on that too. Here's your forecast for night 28 degrees overnight low, considerable cloudiness. Tomorrow's forecast warmer with increasing clouds and uh, 47 degrees. And here comes the bad news. As you can see, we're looking at maybe rain and snow on Friday, maybe a chance of snow on Saturday, then things clear up for Sunday right on through Tuesday with temperatures again warming up uh, after the cold air comes in. But we've got to get past that cold air first. As you can see, overnight lows will also be warming to the low to mid 30s. I wish I had better news, guys, but unfortunately, uh, Mother Nature just wants to keep spring away from us for right now. She, yeah. And it is messing with everything from Denali mm -hmm. to yeah. the opening. And then also, we do have to remind everybody, today's May 15th, so it's time to get those studded tires off. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Even That's though right. we are going to see more Should snow. I depress you a little bit more and no, thinking I can't that the summer it. solstice is only five weeks away? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We feel your pain, guys. <laughs> uh, at least I do. All right, let's get on with this. KTVF and Bailey's Furniture teaming up for a spring dream giveaway where you can win a furniture package from Bailey's worth $2,500. Tune into the Fairbanks Evening News and News Center final each night for the first half of a mystery word. Then visit Bailey's Furniture for the second half and complete your entry for your chance to win. We're going to announce that lucky winner during the Fairbanks Evening News Friday, May 24th. And that will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. As always, we are glad you could join us. If your youngsters are looking for something to do, check out the KTVF Summer Broadcast Academy. It's for kids ages 12 to 17 who want to learn about broadcast television and commercial production. During five days of training, students will produce news stories and commercials, which will air on Channel 11. You can call 458-1801 for more details. Brian Williams is up next with NBC Nightly News. From all of us here at the News Center, have a great night. Good night.